Hello, um, and so welcome to this series that we're calling uh, The Story So Far, which is all about um, the sort of history of the archaeology department here at York. Um, hopefully giving you a bit of insight into, into the world that you, that you know, or hopefully you're soon going to, uh, soon going to know. And today I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Julian D. Richards, who will be very familiar to some of you, perhaps not to others. Um, Julian is, a, is an early medieval archaeologist. He's worked on Anglo-Saxon and Viking settlement um, right across the country. Um, um, and has been involved in a number of big research projects which are quite well known in the field over the last 20 or 30 years. But he's come here today to talk to us about his, um, uh, his place in the department and how, he's, how he finds himself here and why he's still here. And, um, and a little bit about the things that happened when he first came to York and how it's changed over time really. So hello Julian. Hi Steve. So um, first off, could you just tell us a little bit about how you came to, to be working at the uh, Department of Archaeology? Okay, yeah, well, as you say, that's quite a long time ago. I, I first joined York in 1985. Um, at that time, the department wasn't in King's Manor. It was in Micklegate House uh, on uh, Micklegate, but it's the, it was the Georgian townhouse of the uh, Benningborough family, the, the big Benningborough Hall outside York that many people will know. But uh, Micklegate House was their townhouse. It, it's now a I think it's still a backpackers hostel now. It's no longer used by the university because the archaeology department outgrew it um, quite a long time ago. In fact, moved to Kings Manor in, in 1995. Um, but I spent the first 10 years in, in Micklegate House. Uh, I was uh, originally just on a very short term contract because I was on a maternity leave uh, cover for one of the lecturers at the time, Tanya Dickinson. I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> but she decided to um, uh, carry on just working uh, half time and be a mother for the rest of the time. So that led into a, a more permanent position for me, which then became full time. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, when I joined, there were only four other academic members of, of staff. Uh, there was uh, Philip Rartz who was a sort of pioneering field worker that had come from a not from an academic background he'd uh, worked as a as a ministry digger uh, for the ministry of public works and, and buildings and then um, taught extramural archaeology at birmingham but was, became the first founding professor of archaeology in in york um, and also uh, then he'd appointed tanya dickinson as a uh, early medievalist, uh, academic uh, Anglo-Saxonist in particular, and then Harold Mightum, who also focused on medieval, uh, but uh, also did a bit of Iron Age, but he was mainly um, uh, Celtic West and Ireland, was an interest for him. And then shortly before I joined, Steve Roskams had been appointed, the member of staff who's still with us, uh, and Steve appointed as a, particularly as an urban, archaeologists and, and another field worker. So there's a lot of emphasis on, on field work in the, in the department then. Uh, so for academic staff, I was the fifth and also a secretary and a technician. <laughs> and that was it in terms of staff. So that's a very different world, isn't it really? So um, Steve will be familiar to, to uh, some people watching this, I'm sure at least. Um, but those of you who haven't heard of it, the rest of that group of staff, do look them up. Um, Philip Ratz, I'm sure at least uh, many of you have seen the name um, outside our lecture theatre, the Routes Lecture Theatre, uh, you might have wondered who that was. So go ahead and find out. Um, so yeah, that. Sorry, so, so I was just going to mention, yeah, Philip was a very colourful uh, uh, character. Uh, and uh, yeah, would always uh, like to engage academic staff in, in conversation by the photocopier, asking you, putting you on the spot and asking you if you'd read the, the latest book and what you thought about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, he actually um, lived in one of the professorial flats in uh, King's Manor as well in the early days of the university. I think a lot of people won't realise that there were there was about four uh, flats for academic staff, and he and his wife Lorna lived in one of them in the in the top of the attics at the, at the front of King's Manor. So there's a there's a very kind of um historical and medieval focus back then wasn't it really with the, the, the sort of exception of Harold but everybody else is really a sort of medievalist and a, and a Romanist. Yeah and and, and Harold as, as well with a, uh, had quite a lot of medieval 
uh, interest. So yeah, we we were really a, in many ways a department of medieval uh, archaeology, no no prehistory uh, at all. But the idea was that archaeology was taught through themes, uh, which we've retained a little bit uh, of to the present day. But the um, uh, so there was a, a theme on rural settlement, a theme on urbanism, one on churches and, and uh, monasteries, um, and they ran through uh, the degree programme. And Philip's uh, idea was that you didn't really, if you understood the principles and the theory, and there was quite a lot of emphasis on theory as, uh, as well, that it didn't matter which data set you applied to that. So me the medieval data set was what the students were taught through. Uh, but the idea was that they would get a good grounding in, in theory and methods in, in general. Right. So so what kind of numbers were we talking about in terms of students? How big were the programmes? Oh, uh, gosh, yeah. Well, the, um, the whole uh, uh, intake for the uh, for the Department of Undergraduates, there was about, I think, well, when I joined, I think it was about 10 students per year. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, grew gradually till yeah obviously now we're, we're far larger I think we had uh, one or two PhD students most of the time and no uh, master's programs only only master's by research um, and so all the teaching was uh, very seminar based that the whole year cohort would be taught together uh, and uh, it was quite intensive they all had to prepare uh, seminar presentations for, and, and uh, teaching sessions would go on for a whole day uh, uh, and, and with everyone in the in the class having to give a presentation uh, as well as a, then a, a lecture uh, from uh, the staff. Yeah. I've seen the photos of the seminars happening outside under the trees in the courtyard at King's. Oh Park. yeah that's it <laughs> yes and, and indeed uh, uh, some in, in those days happened in the pub as well across the road in, uh, in Micklegate yeah. So, so what about um, sort of um, practical work and, and field work and that sort of thing? How was that, how was that taught? Yeah, there was, a, there was a, well, there always has been, there was a major emphasis on the importance of, of field work and, and the idea that every undergraduate had to do quite a lot of field work in order to understand the discipline and, and qualify as an archaeologist. Uh, as I mentioned, Philip came from a, a strong excavation background where he worked for the as a, as a government digger as a, as a rescue archaeologist um, and uh, uh, was a was an excellent uh, practical uh, archaeologist um, and recruited staff uh, with the exception of, of, of Tanya uh, who also uh, wants to do do field work uh, the students uh, in, when I joined the department, every undergraduate was required to do uh, 13 weeks of uh, uh, fieldwork during their uh, degree, uh, six weeks on uh, a departmentally run excavation, and then another seven weeks on uh, uh, excavations that they had to, to source themselves and, and, and go and volunteer on, on uh, other sites. Yeah. So... Um, and the excavations all happened in the uh, in their summer vacation, as it were. So teaching carried on in effect throughout the summer. Uh, they were um, also assessed on uh, not just on a sort of portfolio of of plans and section drawings and photographs that they would produce, but even assessed on their excavation technique. And there was a pro forma we had to 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 fill in when they were on site with us to to talk about whether they're uh, they, their use of light tools and like, trials and their use of heavy tools and mattocks usually and tools and given marks for these. Great. So well, I know you've been involved in a number of research projects and, and excavation projects with, with, with York staff over the years from Heath Wood and um, so a Viking Cemetery for those of you who don't know about it. And a series of excavations on the on the walls involving Cottam and Cowlam and Burdale. Uh, but you said today you wanted to talk a bit about the uh, excavations at Warrell which are well, yeah. well known to, to uh, lots of people, but perhaps not the detail of actually what went on. Yeah. No, I, well, I think, I mean, Warren, uh, Warren Percy was the, um, the first site that I worked on in the department um, because 
yeah, as I mentioned, Philip felt that all, all members of academic staff should have a fieldwork project. Uh, and uh, as the new boy, I, he, he said, why don't you go out and, and, uh, and dig at Warham? Uh, uh, Steve, was, uh, Steve Ruskins was already working there. But yeah, the department's involvement in, in Warham had been started by uh, Philip uh, himself. Um, for those of you who don't know, Warham, Warham is a very famous uh, archaeological site, uh, mainly known as a deserted medieval village, and it's uh, up on the Yorkshire Wells near, near Moulton. Uh, and um, uh, the excavation of it started long before the department was was founded. Uh, in fact, excavations there started, I think, in yeah 1950, um, when uh, a famous economic historian from the University of, of Leeds, not an archaeologist at all, but uh, a guy called Morris Beresford, who, uh, if you look at sort of economic history texts of the uh, uh, 60s uh, and 70s and, and, and earlier is a sort of key figure, uh, a Marxist historian, in fact. And he'd uh, got interested in the impact of the Black Death um, and took a, some students out from Leeds, his history students. Um, they, as I understand it, they uh, got the train and then the bus from Moulton. Uh, don't know how they took their tools with them, but they took some shovels and, and and, and picks, and they wanted to investigate the, these humps and bumps in the in the fields at, at Warren, which was a sort of earthwork uh, site. And what was preserved was the foundations of the chalk uh, longhouses. And basically, they well, we describe it today as wall chasing. That they dug trenches along the walls. Really, they just wanted to demonstrate that these were building foundations. So that was the sort of first year of of, of Warren, and then. Uh, John Hurst, who uh, was an archaeologist, he worked for the Ministry of Public Works and Buildings, got to hear about this. And he just um, uh, graduated from uh, Cambridge. He'd in, looked at how excavation was done in the Netherlands, which had pioneered large open area excavation rather than digging along walls. And he decided he better sort out what was going on at, at Warham. So he actually joined Morris Beresford uh, in the following year in 51 and then I think they yeah they carried on digging for the next 40 years uh, every summer at Warren Percy opening up trenches in different parts of the site initial focus on the uh, deserted medieval village but then that widened out into looking at the broader landscape and, and the origins of the village which is where York came in because when Philip became a uh, became the professor in York. He wanted to develop a local fieldwork uh, project. Students previously had dug up at Bordesley Abbey near Reading, actually, in the first days of the department, but it made more sense to have something local. So he uh, teamed up with Beresford and, and Hurst, and they became this amazing, very unlikely triumvirate, really, very different personalities and, and, and characters. And uh, yeah, York, the, the, the Warren became one of the approved excavations that all York students uh, were expected to, to go on. Um, and so uh, Steve was uh, joined next uh, and really introduced them to single context planning uh, because he'd been uh, working for the Department of Urban Archaeology uh, in London where they developed single context planning, which is sort of routine nowadays, but earlier excavations at Warren would maybe just be focused on the idea of, of horizons and layers across the site. Uh, so Steve introduced that, which caused a bit of a revolution, really, at recording methods at Warren. And then I uh, joined as well. And, and Steve and I were both really focused on the, um, the, the environs more, not just the, the medieval village, but looking at the origins of, of Warren. So the previous excavations have mainly focused in on in the valley area where there's the deserted church and there's still a couple of cottages there today of, of a post medieval farmstead. Uh, but we started to excavate on the plateau. I was particularly interested in the early medieval origins of Warren, the Anglo-Saxon origins, uh, excavated uh, an Anglo-Saxon sunken featured building, a, a group so-called Gruben House, um, and also 
we were looking at uh, some of the uh, ditch intersections that had been revealed from the geophysics, trying to date uh, the enclosures, which from geophysical survey later turned it out to be mainly eighth and uh, seventh and eighth century uh, enclosures of the type we know as Butterwick enclosures after another site on the wall. So these are sort of crop mark uh, features often. Uh, so, so that was sort of the the departmental focus, and and the York students carried on digging at Warham every summer uh, up to the the end of the uh, of the project in in 1990. And so, can you tell us a little bit about what went on there? How was it? Was it organised? Was it was it was it fun? Was it chaotic? Was it? Yeah, uh... <laughs> it was a a, a big. Project there was every some of the what's known as the summer volunteers. So as well as the York students, there were lots of other uh, regulars who would come back year after year. And, and at the height of the, the summer, there generally be about a hundred uh, people all camped uh, there, all used it, all being catered for by a single uh, kitchen in the in the cottages, and sort of long queues for for uh, almost like a sort of canteen system being served up with your your veg and meat and, and potatoes. Um, Philip caused a bit of a stir when he joined or actually because uh, he decided that they would do a, a lot of things independently. He wasn't too impressed by some of the, the sort of traditions of, of Beresford and, and Hurst. And to some extent, I think it was seemed to be declaring UDI because York decided it would have its own campsite uh, where he, uh, Philip was excavating, they wouldn't join in with the fines processing of, of the rest of the site, which really uh, didn't go down very well. But Lorna was in charge of the York, Lorna Watts Phillips' wife was in charge of the York fines processing. And so they, the York fines were kept separate. So when I joined Warren, there was a bit of a frosty atmosphere between the, uh, the the York contingent and the rest. And I thought, well, this isn't really very productive. So when Philip left me and, and, and Steve to it, we then went uh, and, and sort of reintegrated uh, with the, the rest of the project. It was it was a yeah difficult to, to get used to some of the traditions that one of the great one traditions was a, a morning meeting that would happen every morning with a ring of a, of a school bell and everyone had to assemble outside the cottages. And there'd be a series of little talks from the project directors. Uh, so Maurice Beresford would always give the uh, the weather forecast. He would have been tuning into a, a wireless radio and would uh, say to everyone, oh, it's pro probably just going to be a sea fret today blowing in. You would be fine. You might get a bit damp so, so often. Um, uh, John Hurst would uh, talk about what it, uh, important visitors were expected today. Just lots of, of uh, academics and uh, other people would come to visit. Well, so you'd be told who was coming to, to see the site. And then one of the great rituals was you had to, to go through the rotors, because you imagine with an operation of a sort of hundred people, there had to be rotors for everything. So uh, which the York students had to, to take their turn in. So there'd be announcements of who was on potato peeling rotor that day, who was on washing up rotor, who was on Elson at rotor, of course, which was the least popular one emptying the Elson uh, buckets. Um, but yeah, we had to uh, to do with, with all that. And there were also evening lectures in uh, a huge ex-army tent that was uh, erected outside the uh, uh, the cottages and uh, Morris Beresford would uh, uh, often was a sort of common lecturer talking about the the history of of Warren. Uh, John Hurst often fell asleep I think at the at the front during those I seem to to remember. Um, yeah it was a um, it was a, a very different to to archaeology today, but an awful lot of people who went on to become professional archaeologists did their apprenticeship uh, at, at Warham and learnt their their trade there. It was one of the uh, the sites that, if you were a medieval archaeologist in the in the nineteen seventies eighties, then you, a lot of people did a did a spell at, at Warham and and. 
yeah, as you, as you know, it's become quite an important site for our understanding of the the development of uh, medieval villages and, and their origins and, and desertion. Yeah, I mean, it's got quite a legacy, hasn't it, in all those ways, really. What, can you think, what, what were the, the kind of key things that came out of your time when you, you were there with the department? Were, were, there, were there kind of big findings that, that yeah. we, still, I mean, I think we still know we, about today? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the... Um, the well, the, the, one of the first departmental contributions was uh, uh, Philip looking at the uh, transition from the Roman to the Anglo-Saxon landscape, and indeed he also excavated a, a, a sunken building there that had been uh, dug into a, a, a Roman routeway, which Philip called it a linear movement zone. So it was always a, a great one for inventing new terms. But yeah, it's basically a, a sunken trackway that ran from uh, up from the Roman town at Moulton up across the walls. And then the Anglo-Saxons had come and dug a sunken building into it. So that was quite um, quite an important finding at the time for the sort of continuity of, of, of the landscape. Uh, I excavated another uh, sunken building, um, which was also, uh, in fact, put into, uh, uh, dug into a, a, a later ditch. Uh, and then we found evidence for metalworking in the uh, eighth that was dated in the end of the eighth century. So it also showed quite a lot of late, later continuity than often we assume for these sunken buildings. Uh, and there was um, quite high status copper alloy metalworking going on. We found fragments of moulds uh, for uh, making Anglo Saxon uh, jewellery. So I think that was, for me, that was the most interesting. Uh, uh, thing, but obviously because of my later interests, I also became quite interested in the continuity, or, or not, between the Anglo-Saxon settlement and the uh, uh, the Viking uh, uh, phase at, at Warham, and the fact that there, in fact, was some continuity, particularly on this what we known as the South Manor site of a smithy from the Anglo-Saxons, and then a, a, a Viking weaponsmith took over in the same uh, place. So, right. Yeah. Quite, quite. Yeah, so uh, if, if anyone wants to find out more about that, I guess this, the, the place to go is the series, isn't it? But these, these yeah, all, all, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's the report on. on I know that because uh, the cover of Best Festival, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. there's and, 10 or 11 of these, aren't there? Yeah, 13 in the. 13. In 13 is the, the, the last volume. The majority of them are published by the department. Yeah. Um, but I think, Julian, that, that's, that's, that's great. That's given us real insight into. into um, how the departments uh, changed really over the, over the last kind of 30 years really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, thank, thanks Steve, it's fun talking about the prehistory of the department. <laughs> and we'll have a few more of these, we're going to talk to a, a few other colleagues, um, past and present, um, who have um, uh, uh, been here for, uh, at different points in the history of the department um, and have um, overseen different excavations as well, so uh, keep watching and you'll find out a bit more. Okay, thanks very much Julian. Thanks Steve. Bye for now.